Do you really think this guy is going How would you tell him that he's not? You first, first, first. How would you tell him Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here, back once again to keep up with all these Canadian kooks. Last time the boys from CMI Canada were dismissing the prohibitive food, water, and time requirements of eight humans caring for basically every land animal ever for 150 days. They also got into that time-honored but tired trope of kinds. We're going to continue with them attempting to pick apart the scientific story of life. Cambrian rocks are a group of rocks found around the world in which we find fossils of many of the major animal groups. This is significant because pre-Cambrian rocks found below the Cambrian don't generally contain much fossil material. Oh, I guess we're ignoring the Ediacaran biota, which includes a whole host of macroscopic organisms, including animals, some of which resemble exactly what you'd expect as the ancestor of Cambrian organisms. But then, in the Cambrian, there are fossils in abundance. In fact, this transition is so dramatic that some call it the Cambrian Big Bang. It's really not that dramatic once you realize that all that's really happening is that predators are becoming a more important part of the ecosystem. So mineralized parts of the body are becoming more important and more common in response. And hey, if a part of your body is already mineralized, it's basically pre-fossilized, so you get more frequent fossils. But probably the most devastating impact of the Cambrian explosion is the damage it does to evolutionary ideas, even with evolutionary dating notions. Since most major animal groups appeared suddenly in the fossil record without ancestors... Uh... No. <laughs> we have potential ancestors for mollusks and arthropods, the main hard tissue-bearing organisms at the start of the Cambrian. And further, the main types of organisms they're talking about are the phyla, which is the first step down from kingdom in the classical Linnaean taxonomy. But the thing is that at this point, any minor evolution in the Precambrium would set up what would later appear to be a major division in life. But if you were there to witness it, it would seem minor, since at this point, the difference between phyla was indeed minor, and a matter of what even creationists might see as microevolution. Now let's talk about all that water. Where did it come from and where did it go? Where did it come from? Where did it go? In Genesis 7, 11 and 12, uh, we read, All the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. Now, CMI claims that the flood account is a sober historical account to be taken literally. So who wants to bet that they're going to take the windows, or as it is more commonly translated, floodgates of heaven literally? I'm betting they're going to ignore the implications of the existence of a firmament, which means a solid dome, and floodgates, which are doors or windows in said solid dome, which can let in water from above the sky. You see, the thing is, even though young earth creationism is more or less on the same level as flat earth in terms of scientific plausibility, most young earth creationists know that they can't take the Bible seriously in the way that they want to, because most young earth creationist laypeople reject the flat earth, even though doing so is intellectually dishonest. And the rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Wow. So we have two sources of water there. One of them is the great deep. Yes, the cosmic ocean below the flat earth. Now in the Bible and scripture, this often refers to oceans, but it could also refer to subterranean water, for example. Now the term burst forth suggests that water may have been released through large fissures in the ground or the ocean floor. Now this may have included a, a series of volcanic eruptions, which often release a lot of water. Right, but we know there aren't really subterranean reservoirs of water that could come even close to accounting for the floodwaters because such things would be obvious given our worldwide network of seismic monitoring. They would change how seismic waves propagate, and we have no evidence of such subterranean oceans existing. So we still really don't have enough water on Earth to make a global flood that can cover the mountains. Yeah, what about the oceans themselves? Well, there are several mm. flood models. Not really, there are no flood models that can match reality without essentially an indefinite number of miracles. And when you need more or less infinite magical flood factors, you have a fairy tale, not a scientific model. But the one we feel is, is kind of the current leader of the pack is catastrophic plate tectonics, CPT. Yeah. You know, it's funny. For years, the creationists denied plate tectonics, but now it's so well supported, even they can't deny it anymore. Many lines of evidence indicate that the continents have moved apart. Yeah, because even according to the creationist rate project, catastrophic plate tectonics would generate enough heat to boil all of Earth's oceans at least twice over. So if it's true, again, it requires miracles all the way down, or Noah and the animals on the ark would have basically melted, not been floating on top of the water. 
causing new ocean floor to be formed from hot mantle material. Now, originally proposed by creationist Antonio Snyder back in 1859, as and he thought it took place during the flood. Now, the millions of years folks have applied their time scale to it, and that's the version yeah. that most of us have been taught. First, Baumgartner was on the team at the Rate Project, so even he couldn't solve the heat problem. Second, it seems from a Google Scholar search that no one in the world has ever bothered to author a paper using his Terra model of plate tectonics without him being a co-author, meaning it's not really taken seriously outside his circle of friends. And third, despite CMI calling him the world leader in geophysics and plate tectonics, Baumgartner is employed studying climate change for the U.S. government, not catastrophic plate tectonics or anything else to do with geology. Weird, right? However, Dr. John Baumgartner, the world's leading geophysicist in modeling plate tectonics, used supercomputers and concluded that it could happen rapidly. And cause enough heat to vaporize the oceans twice over. Since that would kill Noah and isn't mentioned in the Bible, the whole model is dead from word one. And that's according to creationists themselves. In Baumgartner's model, one tectonic plate would begin to sink underneath an adjacent plate. He discovered that a breakdown in friction would cause those plates to sink very fast. Meters per second, sort of speeds. Yeah. This caused the original continent to be ripped apart, allowing hot mantle material to form new ocean floor. But the hotter, less dense ocean floor would be perhaps 2,000 meters higher than the existing ocean floor, pushing the seawater up onto the continent. Instant global flood. <laughs> <laughs> it would also vaporize a massive amount of water, producing intense global rainfall. Yeah, the windows of heaven. Yes, it would vaporize a lot of water. Like all of it. Then it would melt all the rock. And it would be too hot for rain, because water literally couldn't condense long enough to hit Earth's surface as liquid. And remember, this isn't according to me. It's according to Baumgartner et al. in the rate findings published by the Young Earth Creationist Organization, Answers in Genesis. Now, skeptics will often say there couldn't possibly be enough water to flood the whole Earth and cover up the mountains, and yeah. especially Mount Everest, the highest point on Earth. Mm -hmm. But Everest is a post-flood mountain. Okay, that means that after the flood until now, Everest has been rising nearly 6 feet 8 inches per year. In reality, it's uplifting about 10 millimeters, or about 0.4 inches per year. So historically, Everest would have had to rise about 200 times faster than it is now, only to stop the instant we could reliably measure it. That seems either very unlikely or very convenient. There are marine fossils at the summit of Everest. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's formed from rocks pushed up from the ocean between the Indian Plate and the Eurasian Plate, which were underwater until the collision pushed them up. That's not exactly surprising. Everest was formed late in the flood as the Indian tectonic plate smashed into the Asian plate. Oh, so we're going to condense the formation of Everest into a year or so, eh? Well, less, but let's go with it. So during the flood, it was being uplifted by a foot and four inches or so each minute. I don't think I really need to explain why it is that plate tectonics doesn't really allow for a mountain to rise by that much. And let's not forget that it formed, as they say, early in the flood. That probably means it had to form about twice as fast. Toward the end of the flood, as the new ocean floor cooled, it would sink into the mantle, forming deep ocean basins. What do you mean cooled? The rate project itself says that the whole process caused more heat than the entire Earth could accommodate without melting. Nothing is cooling. It's all incandescent. Giving the water a place to run to off the continents. The water that at this point is basically 400 degree Fahrenheit steam? Okay, sure. Yeah, now, by the way, today, the, if, if the continents were lowered and the ocean floor raised so that everything was at the same level, there's enough water in the oceans right now for a global flood of about 2.7 kilometers. Wow. And in the immortal words of Dwight Schrute, if onlys and butts were candies and nuts, then every day would be earned to Donkfest. After this, it's another commercial break. How did the animals get to places like Australia? Mm -hmm. There's lots of water in between uh, there and the Middle East where <laughs> the ark landed. Yes, that's true. That's true. And why is it that the distribution of marsupials in South America and Australia matches up so well with their fossil record in Antarctica and the mainstream version of above water, sane speed plate tectonics? Why aren't there any opossums in Africa? Surely a low metabolism arboreal generalist couldn't do too poorly there, or for that matter in Europe. 
I mean, raccoons have a similar niche, and they're thriving as an invasive species in parts of Spain after only a few decades of introduction. Another question that, that we just kind of provided the answer for is, well, how did they get to the ark in the first place? Right, yeah. I mean, at least the Bible says that's God's doing, so it's a miracle. That's at least a miracle that's justified by the text, unlike all the near-infinite miracles that would be required to make the rest of this nonsense work. Now, from Genesis 6.20, we see that Noah didn't have to go on worldwide safari hunting down the, the animal passengers for the ark there. God sent the animals to the ark. With, with a single continent before the flood, that makes it fairly straightforward. Oh, so one of the supercontinents is the pre-flood world. Which one is it? Is it Pangaea? Is it Rodinia? Who knows? But the problem there is that all extant texts that the creationists identify as kinds should have a global distribution in the strata that real scientists identify as Paleozoic. So where are the Permian Canids? Or why don't we see equids in the Old World until the very uppermost strata of the Cenozoic, strata that most creationists seem to think is post-flood? Now the notion of a single original continent came from Genesis 1.9, and God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let dry land appear, and it was so. I'm just going to let that sit there. Apparently, the Bible predicted supercontinents. Convenient how the first modern creationists rejected the whole thing, even though Genesis 1 so clearly indicates that they should have accepted it. For all we know, kangaroos could have been living right in Noah's backyard. Funny then how their entire fossil record is restricted to Australia. But how do we explain them traveling across, across oceans after the flood? <laughs> Did they swim? Good question. <laughs> well, no, but uh, they may have floated on log mats or rafts made of the massive amount of uprooted vegetation mm -hmm. in the flood. I should send this to Matt Powell, because apparently he thinks vegetation mats allowing for rafting is just crazy talk. But the problem is that rafting on a global scale doesn't have a strong directional bias. So why aren't there wombats in China and kangaroos in Ecuador? Uh, some rafts would also be formed uh, by pumice due to volcanic activities. This can, that can float on the water, and these can last a, a pretty long time. Sure, why not? But the same problem that there's a lack of directionality occurs. Also, a kangaroo is going to have a much harder time staying above water on a bunch of chunks of pumice than a log mat. So I'm not really sure this helps. And in both cases, animals could potentially ride quite a distance, you know, and the, the, the wind blows at one place and the animals get on and get off, and the wind changes, it blows it somewhere else, animals get on and get off. So like a train or a bus. Why would any population of animals get on some bunch of crap that just washed ashore and stay on it while it went out to sea? That's just insane. Land animals don't just float off to sea of their own accord, generally. That kind of it makes sense. And then there's the Ice Age. The Ice Age, as if there were only one. The Ice Age, yes, okay. Uh, so Thomas, is there a connection between the Flood and the Ice Age? Well, since there wasn't a global Flood... Uh, no. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> For an Ice Age to occur, you need warm oceans and cold land masses, particularly in the summer. Warm oceans evaporate a lot of water, which then comes down on cold continents as snow. Well, that will make it snowy, but overall what causes what the public thinks of as an ice age is lower solar radiation staying on Earth, caused both by sun cycles and the orbital changes to the Earth's path around the sun. These changes run in cycles called Milankovitch cycles. Essentially, ice ages occur when the eccentricity of Earth's orbit, which you can think of as how elliptical the orbit is, is high. It also helps if the sun is not very active and if there are relatively low levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The temperature of the ocean per se is really not very important to whether there is an ice age. It's overall temperature of the planet's surface that matters most. But this is where I'm going to leave it for today. I really hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. Unless of course you didn't like it, in which case hit the dislike button and let me know why you didn't like it down in the comments. If you do subscribe, make sure you hit the bell icon and turn on all notifications so that you're always notified when there's more Dapper Dino content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I just want to take a moment to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Ben Tovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bede, and Patrick Dennis. My patrons and channel members really help make this channel possible, and without them, this channel wouldn't exist. If you would like to support me, you can click the join link on this channel below this video, or you can click on my Patreon, link in the description, and pledge. On Patreon, there is an option for an annual subscription, which comes with a 10% discount. And joining the channel will give you access to my custom emojis. However, if a regular pledge isn't for you, I do have a merch store. 
And if monetarily helping out the channel isn't a thing you can do, every like, share, and comment really helps the channel.